Coming up on Keys News today. We look into what a £22 million investment could do for Greater Manchester's cycle route. The International Tattoo Show arrives in Manchester for its 14th year. And David is here with his review of Catch Me Daddy. Good afternoon and welcome to Keys News. Our top story today. Plans to improve cycle routes are underway in Greater Manchester. As part of a cycling revolution, the government has confirmed a budget of £22 million. This will be invested in 45 kilometres of cycle routes. Indy Rashid reports. These are the first images of what the Curry Mile could look like if a cycle-friendly scheme gets a green light. After the terrible death last year, the Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg has implemented the £22 million boost to improve the cycle zones here on Wimslow Road. Plans like this are also being introduced at Cheatham Hill, Salford and Manchester Airport with the aims that cyclists are safe and sound on the roads. Hey. Yeah, at the moment the free traffic is on. Most of the time have a car parks in them anyway. Um, if they can actually do something so it's actually dedicated cycle lane, then that would be best. But you get back into Manchester, some parts are worse than others, but you're constantly watching out for potholes. Yeah, I think that looks good because it's away from the, the road, like, because it's parking spaces, so it's not... Because some of them, like, down there, they're really, like, they're on the road where the buses drive, so, yeah, I think that's good. The plans include segregated cycle lanes running behind parking bays to keep both modes of transport separate. Advanced stopping lanes will be a feature along with new bike ports. Councillors believe that the new layout will improve the area for pedestrians and could even boost trade. If approved, the scheme will be a part of a wider series of improvements for cyclists along the Winslow Road corridor, which is used by more than 2,000 riders a day. Inzi Rashid, Keys TV News. Concerns about an explosive chemical at the University of Manchester led to an evacuation of the premises on Wednesday. Jenny Henry was at the scene of the incident and sent this report. At around 11.30am, the emergency services were called here to Sackville Street because a number of the University of Manchester's buildings have been evacuated due to concerns over how acetone peroxide was being stored. Acetone peroxide, an extremely explosive and erratic chemical that is heavily linked with terror attacks. If the chemical is not stored properly, it can turn into a very unstable substance. Yeah, uh, we were working in the Wright Robinson building. Uh, security have come to evacuate all the, all the buildings on North Campus something to do with some chemicals leaking or become unstable or something. The Parisa building has been, there's a volatile chemical called acetone peroxide in there and when it crystallises it becomes highly volatile and that's the reason pretty much all of North Campus has been evacuated. It's, it's one of, I think it's on H for the uh, nuclear experiment. That, you know, they mess up about with substance. If they, if it, yeah, as I said, if you touch it, it's going to explode. That's why they evacuate everyone from North Campus. You can see a very scary experience. Loads of postmen everywhere and didn't quite know what was going on this morning. So I had to get out of the building. The fire service, police, ambulances and bomb disposal squad were all present. Four and a half hours later, the scene finally cleared. There are unconfirmed reports that the cause was a student's experiment gone wrong. Jenny Henry for Keys TV News, Manchester. Jenny joins us in the studio to have a look at today's papers. We'll first start with the Manchester Evening News. Yeah, so we've got the MEN have gone with the um, terrorist plot to block the Arndale. Um, Ab Abid Nazir, who was the guy that obviously was uh, on charge for it, he's been found guilty. Uh, he's been charged in America. He's uh, going to go to prison for life. Um, but still in the UK, he's not been charged for anything due to lack of evidence. 
Right, OK. So what about the Daily Mail then? We've also got a terrorist yeah, story in the, there. The Daily Mail have gone with the terrorist story as well. Yeah, they've gone for um, these jihadi called callers. Uh, so basically the story is that um, Islamic fanatics are um, ringing up UK pensioners and posing as policemen to take bank details, um, take the savings off these pensioners. And it's actually named them as one of the richest terror groups there's ever been um, due to these things. They're stealing like tens of thousands of pounds off people. So what um, do the police say they should do now? What should pensioners be doing to watch out for uh, it? You, you just need to be wary, have your wits about you. You should know who's calling and if your bank is calling they should be able to confirm that. Right, okay then. So what about the Daily Star? So the Star have gone with the ongoing story of obviously this Becky Watts murder. She was 16 and she was murdered by, well, her stepbrother's been charged. Uh, Nathan Matthews has been charged, you can see him there. Uh, dressed as a convict as a fancy dress party. Um, his girlfriend, a uh, 21-year-old, she's been accused with a, um, per the perverting the course of justice. Um, so uh, there's also four other people that have been taken in as well, uh, accused of helping him out with the, uh, with the case. So that's obviously still ongoing as well. OK, so The Guardian have also covered that, but they've also got a BBC story as the main one. What's that about? Yeah, that's OK. So the BV BBC story is about um, external regulation. So people aren't happy with the way that the BBC is regulated at the minute due to the Jimmy Savile story and the blurred lines of who is actually responsible. And um, they want someone to say what can and can't be done at the BBC. And currently, obviously, people aren't happy with that and they want something new. So this is the first time that the BBC have considered not being um, self-regulated and having um, an external board to do this? Yeah, they don't want anyone to be, um, it, they don't want it to be internal anymore. Obviously there's things like Ofcom, but um, they're internally regulated at the minute and people want to see a change. Right, okay, well thank you very much for joining us in the studio today, Jenny. Now we move on to the latest sport with Ben. Salford University Karting Club made it two wins from two after winning the British University Karting Championship second round. The Salford team had to battle the weather as much as they battled their rivals. Oliver McKenzie reports. It's one of the fastest growing and most diverse varsity competitions in the country. With over 50 universities competing in two divisions across four rounds for the right to be crowned the fastest university in the UK. That's the title that Salford University are halfway towards, with Jochen Holmstuhl winning the pick of the races at Butmore Park. The Danish-born speedster initially fell behind in this race after running wide in the opening lap, before powering back to triumph in race two. There are also podiums for Jake Wright and team captain Craig Pratt, and an overall race win to lead Salford at the head of the rookie division of the championship. I caught up with the victorious captain after the race. Yeah, raced well. Had a couple of mishaps here and there, but now we pulled through. And got Absolute through. torrid conditions out there today. How, how tough is it driving in the wet compared to the dry? Every two corners you've got to wipe your face, so losing tighter tracks is a bit of difficult, but yeah, you just got to push through, really. Yeah. Obviously, you've got the absolute machine, Joachim, just powering through. Another win for him today. Is he the best person in this division, do you reckon? Uh, he likes to think he is, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, he's a top driver, he races professionally, so yeah, fair play. Salford University Karting Club is awash with both youth and experience, something that they will hope will lead them to glory in this year's BUKC and a future sporting dynasty in the years to come. Oliver McKenzie, Keys News, Kent. In the conference, Macclesfield will look to boost their promotion credentials away to Aldershot. In the conference north, Staley Bridge are aiming to distance themselves from the drop zone as they host league leaders Barrow. In the Northern Premier, FC United of Manchester will try to extend their lead at the top against the Kings Lynn. And in the First Division North, Salford City face Lancaster as they look to consolidate their place at the top of the league. That's all from Sport Today. Join us Tuesday for more. Ten years since the Adoption of Children Act came into effect, giving gay, lesbian and bisexual couples the same rights as heterosexual adopters. Charities have come together this week to highlight the importance of adoption and fostering in the North West. Jamie Starboyski went to find out more. 
This week it's LGBT Adoption and Fostering Week, focusing on how LGBT people become adopters and foster carers for vulnerable children. It's all about raising the community's awareness for the need for foster carers and adopters for um, very vulnerable children. And Bernardo's over, have over a hundred years experience of recruiting foster carers and adopters. The idea of the week is that we encourage lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender people to consider adoption or fostering when they're thinking about parenthood. Without people that identify as LGBT adopting children, there would be an even greater shortfall in adopters. So it was a really important um, act that came into force. You hear a lot of myths out there as to, you know, LGBT pe people only get older children. That's not necessarily the case. I have a friend who adopted a seven-month-old um, little girl. So and and there's, there's lots of uh, examples of that within the organisation. I'm an adopter myself and one of the first things that I did when I was thinking about adoption was join New Family Social and go to their summer camp. They're just amazing children and you know you can see all of their skills and you know really shine when you get somebody that makes a little minion biscuit. Come to an event, find out what's available, um, find um, an agency that you're interested in and, and really go for it. If there's space in your home and your heart for a child then really go for it. Jamie Starboyski, Keys TV News. Now Manchester Central was host to the annual and international tattoo show. Catwalks and live needlework entertained a crowd of over 8,000 people. Ben Hobson has more. This weekend saw the international tattoo show return to Manchester for its 14th year. Manchester Central welcomed 145 artists and opened its doors as over 8,000 visitors poured in, meaning advanced ticket sales were up 364% on last year. Hundreds of stalls were set up inside, and areas to sit down and take all of it in were included. It was time to get inked up as visitors sought after more colourful tattoos, whereas some went for more of a big deal. So here at the tattoo show in Manchester Central, we have a variety of different cultures. But as you can hear from me in the background, it's not just tattoos that were on show. Included over the weekend as entertainment was everything from catwalks to angle grinders and even a company who created Rounders Gold Teeth. And Manchester was a very popular destination for many. Manchester's obviously hotbed of anything exciting that's happening in the north anyway. Largest northern city, absolutely fantastic. So um, I think that uh, the artists that we've attracted from overseas um, have come to this event not just because we run a great show but also for the experience in the city as well. Brilliant artwork from painters gave an eerie feel to the event as we walked round startled with the constant sound of needles in the background and what I feared from the start was in the pipeline. This was not in the script. Ben Hobson, Keys TV News. Now, the Salford Student Union elections are open for voting tomorrow. In the build-up, candidates have been showing why they should be made president in a rather unusual way. Ben Senior has more. Speed dating, but not quite how you've seen it before. At Bar Atmosphere, candidates swap menus for manifestos and chat up lines for speeches as the race to become student union president began. The 26 candidates looked to impress, with some showing their hand early and others choosing to add some clout to their campaign. But what was it like to promote yourself and gain votes in this traditionally romantic format? It's something that I don't think went as planned because it became a free-for-all. Instead of the speed dating, it became an open session to which the original idea for a Q&A should have been. And it became a shouting match. And that's what's wrong with student politics. It's not quite love in the air here in Bar Atmosphere, but speed dating is providing the perfect opportunity for candidates to prove why they want to be president. Students have been making their way around the table to see who they want to put in charge. As the political battles heated up, it wasn't always an easy job to keep everything on track. Oh, I've had my like democracy bell, which I've been trying to ring and maintain order. Um, but you know, I think it's just great that everyone's so passionate and to be a part of that's really fun and everyone's doing it respectfully, which is the most important thing. For candidates, the speed dating is over, but the race for presidency has only just begun, with voting open tomorrow. Ben Senior, Keys TV News. I'm joined by David Barker, who's here to review the film Catch Me Daddy. So, David, uh, directed by Daniel Wolf on his debut. Mm -hmm. 
What's it all about? So Catch Me Daddy is the story of a Pakistani um, girl who's run away from home with her boyfriend. She's run off to West Yorkshire and she's tried to escape sort of her family, but her dad's not having that, so he's sent um, some of his family members and also a couple, one or two sort of our men to sort of track them down. So it's really it's um, a chase movie. It's them trying to run away from the people that are after them. You mentioned West Yorkshire. Is this a film where the location plays quite a big role? Um, yeah, it's quite good to see. I mean, this has been funded by um, sort of Screen Yorkshire in part, and it's good to see sort of the Yorkshire Dales on the um, screen. I mean, it's West Yorkshire, so we also get some of um, Rochdale and Alderman there as well, so it's quite a local film in that sense. But it's, um, it's good to see this area of um, Britain. You know, a lot of British films you get sort of London and perhaps, you know, you get up to Glasgow with some Scottish films. It's nice to see sort of an area that isn't portrayed in film too much. David Walsh Davy, but there's also some unfamiliar faces in this. Is this an experimental British film? Um, I wouldn't say it's experimental. I think it's um, quite sort of stuck to Tracy Rose. They do some things in it, but it's a low budget film, so you're not that familiar with the faces. I mean, the lead act, actress in it, she was um, a sports coach prior to being picked up by a casting coach. So it's, I think it's the faces we'll see go on to do better things, but they're unknown at the moment. And uh, Daniel Wolf co-wrote this with his brother. We've seen the Cohen brothers be quite successful as a duo. Do you think this is a similar thing that they can do? Um, I can see them going on to do stuff. This is quite a short about it. It's quite stylistic. There's a lot of good stuff in there. So, yeah, I can see them going on to be a formidable partnership. And in terms of other British films that have followed these themes and genres, how does it compare? Um, it compares quite well. It sort of stands its own. It reminds me a lot of Ben Wheatley's um, Kill List that was quite sort of atmospheric and tense in the same sort of way. He's gone on to do great things, so I imagine they will so as well. Just quickly to wrap up, overall impressions? Really good, solid British film. If you want to get out and support British film, I think this is the one at the moment. Fantastic. So let's find out what the weather will be doing. Cecilia Helling has a look at the forecast. Good afternoon, here we are in Cloudy Media City with a weather update. Today we are expected to have scattered showers throughout and it's going to remain cloudy with highs of 8 degrees. Over to yourselves in the studios. And finally, the northern favourite of Pine Mash is being celebrated in Manchester this week. Our reporter Kim Harrison went along for a taste of the event. British Pie Week has hit Manchester and it's time to celebrate our love for the pie right here in Northern Quarter. Pie Minister has run the event for five years and this year has held its very own pie competition. We've had uh, our own pie election, so over the last uh, four weeks our like regular customers and our VI pies have been voting for like, their favourite pies to come back on the menu. So obviously it gets like, the local community involved with us and um, yeah, so they've voted for their three most popular pies that we've had on the menus over the last ten years. Minty lamb, Thai chuck and Ariba banditos were the three unique winners. The Thai chicken, Thai green curry in a pie is a bit unusual and that's uh, come second, so that's on our menu all this week. So we'll use free range British chicken, uh, it's got lime, coconut, sweet potato and chilli. Um, so it's like a really fragrant Thai green curry. If you had to create um, yeah. one of your own speciality pies, what would you create? Own speciality pies. Um, I would probably make a full English pie, probably for breakfast. So probably bacon, sausages, beans, mushrooms. I'd go for kind of a quattro formaggio kind of arrangement for cheeses. I'd probably have feta, I'd have goat cheese, mozzarella I'd have in there. So any cheese you can imagine. An apple crumble on one side and uh, a meat and potato thing on the other side. British Pie Week has been going on all around the world and ends on the 8th of March. This year's election winner was actually the Minty Lamb Pie and here I have the Wild Shroom. It's all gravy here in Northern Quarter Prime Minister. Back to you, Kim Keys News. So that's all we have time for on today's show, but you can always head over to our website, keysnews.net, for all the latest breaking news and sport. Join in on the conversation on our Twitter at Keys News and also on our Facebook page. The team at Friday First will be back on air tomorrow at 1.30. We'll round up with the best bits from Keys News this week. Don't forget to join them if you can. Thank you for watching us. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye.